Okay, this is a review of the SL AE20125 10 MHz function generator coming out of Germany. Okay, well I guess uh, rather than being a tear down, this is going to be a build up video because this thing actually came as a kit. I guess I should have uh, <coughs> looked at my uh, purchase a little more closely, but cool. Uh, it's got a case which has some pre cut out assembly labels and okay that looks really easy to use and uh, a bag full of parts okay well I got it assembled uh, took a couple evenings it was actually a pretty straightforward assembly project they say it's for beginners but um, it's actually probably more of an intermediate kit um, but it's kind of a cord construction they have an LCD display here they have the, the main board here with the parts on it we'll talk about those in a moment uh, the switches are all here uh, the reason for this, of course, is that it goes into uh, a little constructor's case they've uh, provided. I'll put that in in a moment, but it uh, gives a sort of a professional look to the uh, kit. It's uh, got a amplitude adjustment, a DC offset adjustment, and then there's a sort of a mini wing structure here and the outputs in the front. Um, it's actually fairly easy to use. Digital synthesizer, so you can adjust the frequencies. Uh, digit by digit, which is um, very handy indeed. You don't need a frequency counter with this kind of design. Uh, it does the sine wave, the triangle wave, and the square wave. Those are really kind of expected. Uh, more interestingly, it does um, modulation, so we can do um, frequency shift keying and phase shift keying. So that's kind of fun if you're playing with communication hardware and you want to uh, you play with uh, some keys, you can do this generator. That's uh, for a $70 little circuit board kit. That's kind of actually impressive. And there's a bunch of other types of uh, things you can do with it. Uh, because it's all digitally controlled, it's um, you have initial frequencies, the source, you can actually uh, modulate the generator externally, it looks like. So, um, actually, from a feature viewpoint, uh, you're actually getting a fair bit of features here. In terms of the back, um, we'll uh, go to a still picture here and point out each part individually, but uh, for now you can see I'm powering this one off my uh, little uh, power supply. Uh, it takes uh, a variable DC voltage. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little pick micro, I'd imagine, under here. They don't actually go and state the, the vendor's name, but it uh, has all the signs of a pick micro. The actual heart of the product is down here. This is an analog device. This is, uh, component which um, really actually generates all the frequencies. This is actually just the, the USB uh, adapter for the processor. And as you can see, just a whole whack of uh, through-hole components. Um, I'm still quite amazed you can buy through-hole components like this to this day and age, uh, all the way to 2012. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty critical when you're doing a little kit for people. It's uh, obviously pretty tough to solder the SMT parts. With this kit, actually, they took the care of providing these two parts solder on the board. So, um, if you're not super skilled with a solder iron yet, that's actually a pretty, pretty nice uh, little feature they've done. So, the kit actually to go on together really quite, quite uh, well. It's um, really quite a straightforward design. Okay, so the real key in any uh, signal generator is the uh, purity of the output waveform, sometimes known as total harmonic distortion. If you're in the audio world, uh, otherwise known as sometimes signal integrity. The uh, generator powers up at a 1 kilohertz sine wave, and uh, what we have here on the scope is, of course, the uh, the 1 kilohertz being produced by the uh, generator. Now, my scope here actually has an FFT function in it, so it can do a spectrum. The real uh, the real way of doing this, of course, is with a spectrum analyzer, but uh, that's a somewhat pricey tool. Uh, I don't happen to have one in my lab. But here I am, I'm adjusting the, uh, the frequency, you can see it's going up, and what's happening is as the frequency goes up, of course, the, uh, the spectral plot, which is a plot of um, frequency versus amplitude, has a little peak here. What we're looking for is to make sure there's no spurs on the peak, which is an indication of uh, a design error, which is uh, pretty common, actually, in a, uh, a little inexpensive uh, frequency generator. Some people make some pretty fundamental errors, so... And here we can see, actually, this one's uh, performing uh, quite admirably. So now we set it up to its uh, absolute maximum frequency at 10 million uh, hertz, uh, <laughs> using the European standard, of course, the period is the comma, and the comma is the period. 
uh, and we can see that uh, the spectral output is a little bit more noisy, the waveform is a little bit more bouncy, uh, really at the limits of this uh, product, you see we have lots of spurs up here, so 10 megahertz, mm, yeah, not, uh, not entirely usable. Square wave. Now, square wave actually bears uh, some discussion because it's uh, it also suffers from the effect of uh, the driver. So uh, the classic FFT pattern 135 odd harmonics for square wave, uh, nice crisp corners, but we're only sitting at uh, 30 kilo 300 kilohertz, 400 kilohertz, 500, 600, 800. Now we're at uh, a megahertz, and we can start seeing that the driver, um, the driver, uh, definitely starts knocking the corners off. So um, it's not a bad driver, but it's not uh, obviously powerful enough to sharpen up the corners entirely. More problematically, uh, I start to see a lot of jitter here on the end. That's kind of problematic, actually, if you're doing digital design to have a bunch of jitter like that. So I'm not sure if it's um, the way I've set this thing up and get rid of it, or if it's just inherent in the the basics of the design. But um, yeah, that's actually a problem. There should have been a divisor um, at the end of the uh, digital synthesizer to uh, to make sure that the, the duty cycle could have been maintained. So I'll play with that a little bit more. But uh, right now, I'm sort of seeing a fair bit of jitter. So here's the other thing you notice with this uh, function generator. What I've done is zoomed into a waveform and uh, just stopped the scope from acquiring. And what you see here is uh, there's noise in the waveform, and it's a suspicious frequency. Actually, it's 25 megahertz. It's exactly the local oscillator of the ADD. So what's happening is the local oscillator is leaking into the actual output of the product. Um, again, it's something you could actually solve with a little more careful design. But uh, this little gadget uh, shows that behavior. Let me just uh, start the thing up again. All right, we'll zoom out uh, back to the actual waveform itself. Uh, so what I have here is a triangle wave. So it looks pretty good on the uh, the waveform itself, but when you uh, zoom into it, to what happens is uh, you can uh, you can see that 25 megahertz. So in this uh, part of the uh, video, I uh, take a look at the uh, USB connection. There's a little computer control for the product. Uh, but it's actually producing a, a triangle wave. Now, <clears throat> you can see it's actually not looking too stable, and that was kind of interesting. Uh, the thing comes with a uh, built-in application for a computer. You can actually dial in all the uh, frequencies and the sweeps, and it's really quite handy. You actually don't even need to use the front keyboard and LCD display, but curious thing I found is that uh, if you uh, have the USB plugged in, the waveform becomes very unstable. Just unplug it. And we come back to the scope here, we can see it's actually a nice solid uh, triangle wave. So clearly some sort of interaction, the USB system and uh, the little netbook I'm using. So I just switched to another computer I happen to have in uh, my workshop and uh, unfortunately the behavior persists. So. There's something quirky either going on with my USB port or perhaps both my computers, but uh, definitely introducing some noise. Now, um, <clears throat> it's a little bit unfortunate because the actual application is uh, is very useful. Okay, well, let's see, uh, see how this thing actually works. And the really great thing about a kit is, of course, they provided full schematics, so you can uh, take a real good look at uh, the design decisions they made, and they're kind of interesting. Um, they built the whole thing around this analog device's AD9833. It's a, a programmable waveform generator. Uh, analog device is definitely a prime spec vendor. They produce a tremendous number of um, high quality parts. So uh, it looks like their basic fundamental choice is pretty good. Uh, it's interesting how they've actually uh, used it though. Uh, IC2 there is this analog device part that we were speaking of uh, just a moment ago with the data sheet. Uh, really the heart of the instrument. Uh, to the left is a standard uh, crystal oscillator providing a 25 megahertz clock uh, that's basically the fundamental clock which controls the whole uh, the whole scheme of things uh, above that on IC2 there's a few pins three pins that are basically in a, an SPI interface it's a serial protocol to the microprocessor um, now when I actually was looking at this kit before I bought it one that really interested me is uh, that they did something quite right that uh, often gets overlooked and is done very incorrectly uh, when people 
uh, build a little uh, for function generator, and that's basically a reconstruction filter here. Uh, this L1, C4, L2, C5, L3, C11, uh, that's a three-stage filter. Uh, it's a low-pass filter. Um, and what it's doing is it's actually rejecting all the high-frequency components which are generated by the uh, little digital synthesizer. Uh, one thing happens when you take a digital signal and try to convert it back into its analog equivalent. Uh, uh, what you're doing is kind of a piecewise uh, construction of a waveform. And every time it's a piecewise construction goes from uh, point to point, you have basically an inflection point on your curve. Uh, and you got to get rid of those, and that's basically what this filter is doing, so that's kind of cool. Um, there's actually a relay in this thing on the top here, uh, so when you're doing a square wave mode, you would take the filter out, which is, of course, also spot on. Now, on a more discouraging note, uh, you can see there's two grounds on this chip. There's an analog ground and a digital ground. Um, and the manual for the part's really quite explicit. You have to keep those separate. Uh, basically, any noise on your digital side, if it leaks into your analog side, is going to result in waveform distortion, and I suspect that's what's happening here with a 25 megahertz signal. Uh, what you're supposed to do is move all your digital grounds onto one plane, put all your analog grounds together, uh, and then of course you have to tie them together. You can't just keep them floating apart, but uh, you tie them in a way what's known as a single point ground, so current can't flow between that point, so the digital noise doesn't get coupled into the analog plane. So, uh, now I didn't take a really close look at the circuit board before I put it together, um, so it's a little hard to see how they split the planes up. Uh, but I do speculate that that might be one of the reasons why we're seeing a little bit more local oscillator noise than I'd be comfortable with. Okay, so uh, on this page here, uh, you can see IC3. It's a uh, operational amplifier. Um, it's actually a fairly decent unit. Uh, it has pretty uh, wide bandwidth. Uh, as you saw, the square wave, of course, not wide enough that it uh, can really uh, crisp up the corners there, but uh, for the uh, sine wave function, the triangle, it's uh, obviously um, adequate. Uh, basically being run in a, uh, just a classic non-inverting mode. Uh, there's a few adjustment pots, uh, so you can set the thing up. Uh, there's the zeroing functions uh, held in the circuit as well, but this is kind of what you'd expect. Now there's no ESD protection on the output, so uh, other than that 49 ohm resistor or R11, so it might be a little sensitive to being zapped by ESD, but uh, beyond that, uh, kind of a traditional way of doing an output in a, in a simple manner. Okay, well there you have it, the ASAL AE20125, uh, an inexpensive little unit. Uh, you can get it off eBay for um, $70, a little bit uh, closer to 90 if you want a case with it. That's actually a, a fair price. Uh, it's got a few problems with it, but um, again, uh, don't try to compare a $90 device with, say, a couple thousand dollar Agilent uh, function generator, because uh, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, take a look at uh, what you're spending and what you're getting. Certainly looking for a little hobbyist unit. If you want to learn a little more about function generators, you get a chance to actually build this one up by hand and play with it. And uh, that's honestly quite a bit of fun. And uh, it was a fun little assembly. So, um, another interesting little item you can get off eBay.